Hey, it's a crazy world out there, and sometimes we don't know who to trust. But we're going to talk about it. Interesting story ahead. Stay with us. everyone and welcome to the beginning of the last days. My name is Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson and uh, I've just been hearing from so many of you that you are enjoying every single show. Um, hope that you try to catch them. You can catch them on Rumble, you know, later in the week and some of you watch every single night and uh, I'm really blessed by that because we're friends. We're going through this process together and we know Things are nuts. I mean, they really are. Can you believe that the best that the Democratic Party in the United States of America could offer up uh, was Biden? Can you believe that? Um, I think they should have like gone the way that Canada went, like get someone with good hair, right? Gavin Newsom, sure, he's kind of a crazy dude, doesn't know what he's doing, destroying his own, uh, his, his own state down there in California, but the guy looks good, you know? With Biden, you're just not sure what's going to happen, right? Like sometimes the Botox is wearing off and then you see a little bit, you know, more wrinkles than other times. And then he can't find his way off the stage and stuff. I just think they could be doing a better job than they're doing. But at least Obama, AJT, he's finally showing up. Um, Obama and Clinton, uh, the Rat Pack, are uh, sticking together and they're like... <laughs> They can't, they can't make Biden quit. So some people say, you know, Obama's running the show down there, right? And I'm like, if Obama is running the show, what was he thinking with just like not making Biden, you know, say, you know, this has been a good time. I've had a wonderful, have I had a good time? Yeah, I think I've had a good time. You know, why not just usher him off the stage and then let somebody with good hair come in? and further destroy the country, but at least they would be good looking. You know, I don't know. So you know that I love to read from my dad's Bible and he passed away two and a half years ago and I miss him every day. And one of the things that I didn't know when he was here, I saw this Bible always beside, I've seen my dad read this Bible many times. I saw it always beside his chair. He had sort of like that Archie Bunker chair, you know, but he was a better man than Archie, if I could just say. Um, so he, uh, he always had this Bible sitting there beside his, his chair and not till he passed. I, I mean, it wasn't my place to go rifling through his Bible. So not till he passed, did I come to the understanding that he pretty much underlined and crossed and, you know, left notes and, and, uh, in different colors of pen, blue, red, you name it. Um, he, he would put dates in here, all kinds of things. And so every day with you guys, I like to go through his Bible and find one more little gem that he left. So today it opened up to uh, Psalms 37 we're at. And um, he underlined two scriptures in Psalms 37, uh, verse 22 and 23. <clears throat> it says, for such as be blessed of him, that means God, shall inherit the earth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. And they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. So what we have in our world today is people who do right and people who do wrong. And every single day we're trying to figure out as the people of Canada, you know, what is going on. And really it's the people of the world. We've got all kinds of things. And uh, we've seen an increase in corruption, an increase in not understanding why people do the things that they do. From back east in Eastern Canada, I'll never forget, you know, being kind of excited uh, when uh, Doug Ford was going in. And then soon thereafter, wondering what decisions he was making. Same thing with uh, Jason Kenney, you know, different ones. Um, we watch the politicians and then we're sometimes surprised by what's happening. And it, it's hard 
to make everything mesh together and be logical. Now, I do have a share here. So two years ago, two years and two months, uh, looks like maybe three, three months ago, uh, corruption in Canada, worst in a decade, finds international watchdog. Corruption in Canada amid ongoing scandal in British Columbia, and today we're going to be talking about Alberta, Canada has once again slipped down the Transparency Canada rankings for corruption to 13th place. I wonder what they're at now. <laughs> Two years later. <laughs> hey, with everything, like what does the world think? Do you ever read about Canada in the, uh, in the India India uh, Post, uh, the national newspaper there, oh my gosh, they do not think very much of us. Well, Trudeau, of course. So this says that Canada has once again slipped down an international ranking for corruption, standing at 13th in the world and well back of world leaders such as Denmark, New Zealand and Singapore. Since 2015, the year Liberal leader Justin Trudeau became Prime Minister, Canada has fallen nine points to score to a score of 74 out of 100 on the Transparency International's 2021 Corruption uh, Index. So no country has, has seen a bigger drop in ratings since 2017 than Canada. I can't even imagine. Ah, we don't have time to look it up. Uh, I can't even imagine, you know, what it is now. So the thing that we deal with in all, all of our communities is, you know, um, we elect people, uh, people come into power in certain places, and then uh, we often can see things that are going wrong. We've seen it in our own British Columbia and, and with a few setbacks even that we're experiencing now. And of course, we've been run by NDP for, you know, provincially for quite a while, and uh, it hasn't done us any favors at all. We're watching things go on in our schools that, you know, my grandparents would just roll over in their graves at what's happening. And it just seems that common sense has gone out the window and all kinds of things are being said and happening. So there came across my desk a story that uh, was regarding um, some, you know, I, I have a good friend and a viewer that um, told me, you've got to get this story. You've got to highlight this story and, and hear what these politicians have to say. And so I appreciated that very much. And because I love and trust this person, and I know that they're very good, I said, yeah, I want to hear about it. And so then I started hearing that uh, my guests today have been on a few different, um, a few different programs, and they've been expressing some grave concerns over corruption that they've seen taking place in Alberta. So right there in the beautiful place of Chestermere, uh, former mayor Jeff Colvin uh, is here. And there was a little bit of a drama that went on in this town. So uh, Mr. Colvin, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, we'll start with you and we have two other gentlemen that are sort of behind the scenes and we'll bring them in and, and introduce them in time. But maybe you can start by giving us uh, an overview of where you live and how you came to be involved in, uh, you know, you're calling out some things in, in your city. So tell us about that. Uh, thank you very much for letting us come on your program today. Um, yeah, I, I was the former mayor and we had three other councillors that were removed December 4th, 2023 uh, by Municipal Affairs, Rick McIver. We also had three CAOs um, removed at the same time. And that'll seem a little odd that there was three CAOs, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, <clears throat> I had uh, uh, grown up in Alberta. I'd grown up in Calgary, actually. Um, my family was has been, geez, third generation, I guess, in Calgary. Uh, my great grandpa came here in 1905 um, in Fort Calgary, actually. So it was, uh, we've been Albertans and, and Calgarians for the whole time. Chestermere, which is just on the east edge of the city of Calgary, uh, is where I've been calling home for approximately just over 25 years now. And so I have three kids, three daughters um, that keep me busy. And uh, they're all reasonably grown up now for 15. I actually just had a birthday. So 15 to uh, 21. Uh, so it's uh, it's been a busy time. And Chestermere has been, when I first moved here, there was about 2,500 residents. And right now, we're still small, but we're about 30,000 residents. And so it's uh, it's growing quite rapidly in the sense of, of, of that scale. 
Um, and what I what I noticed with my background, my background was in in developments, which is um, uh, subdivisions from raw land as well as uh, condominium developments, office buildings, as well as uh, home construction. Um, <clears throat> and I was also involved in utilities, water and sewer development and uh, operations of treatment facilities, et cetera. So I'd been doing that for about um, 20, 20, 20 plus years. Um, and that's where I, with that background, I started seeing a lot of things in our city that were start, were, weren't really making sense. And we started, you don't get a lot from the, as a, as a public person, um, the cities do a good job at hiding things from you or keeping, keeping you uh, out of the loop. Um, however, sometimes though, we would get some information and, and it would seem irregular. Um, some of the things that were happening and, and I knew the pricing in the industry of pretty much most of the stuff the city does, um, you know, from an, from an actual operations perspective, uh, you know, that's very similar to my business. <clears throat> Um, one of the things that happened in Chestermere, though, you know, very early, well, I guess it was about 2016, we had uh, approximately all of our cit citizens, about just under 6,000 uh, voting residents that signed a petition to investigate the council at the time and to investigate our, our, our utility um, for water and sewer at the time for corruption. And, and that petition went to municipal affairs, and unfortunately, they did nothing. And you find that kind of odd. Um, and in our situation, we uh, had just learned here about, well, two months ago, I guess, um, after we were removed, that there was only 37 letters that were sent to municipal affairs in regards to our council. And, and of those 37, approximately uh, 12 or 15 of them were from our three um, councillors that we, we, we were using the term rogue, rogue councillors. Um, so really from the citizens, you know, we, we ended up having very, very few letters that were talking about, not, not just things that they were concerned about, about our governance. Um, it could be simple things, even about storm ponds or something like that. Um, so it, it just didn't make sense what Rick McIver did and how he moved so quickly to investigate us within just over two months of us taking office. And, um, you know, in those two months, when we we were elected October 18th, 2021. And within those two months, Rick McIver started the inspection uh, and the review of, of for the inspection. Um, and we're unfortunately, we were the very first city in the history of Alberta to have an inspection called that fast. And you kind of wonder, well, what the heck did we do in the first uh, two months when we got in? Um, and honestly, in that time period, there was nothing that we did that was irregular in relation to the MGA, which is the Municipal Government Act. Um, what we were doing, though, coming in is that we had very clear, um, a very clear platform of trying to reduce corruption and look at ways of, of saving taxpayers dollars. And that was that was our focus. My background is I'm not a politician. I'm only a business person. And so I believe that it was important to apply standard business principles to government from the perspective of um, our goal is to get our job done and get it done on purpose, on time and on budget. And that was, that's really the focus. So, uh, you know, I, I ran and was successful in, in October of 2021. Um, and we ran on a few things that were very, very suspect. Um, our previous administration had put in a, a new bylaw that was called the civil discourse pol policy. And what it did is it gave the city powers to go after its citizens for any kind of speaking out, any kind of freedom of speech. And, you know, obviously a politician doesn't like criticism per se, but that doesn't mean you should be going after your citizens legally and, and um, you know, threatening them and bullying them, et cetera. And, and so that was one of the things that we wanted to repeal immediately when we got in, which we did. And um, unfortunately that did raise a lot of questions, I guess, from, from senior staff that, that wanted that policy, which was surprising. And then it also raised questions from municipal affairs, uh, which we thought was a little odd. In that first month, we uncovered um, a lot of corruption that we were concerned about. And we brought that information to Minister Recaiver and municipal affairs. And surprisingly, they weren't interested in looking at it and ta or talking about it. And then, and then I was at one point I was like, well, what do you guys do? 
um, <laughs> why, why, what are you here for if you're not going to help us um, look at what's concerning us as a municipality and what, what is hampering our operations? And when we first got in, we identified that we were told that the city was broke. And I believe that the city was broke in the way that it was being managed and run. And then we were also told by the previous administration and the current administration, sorry, the current administration and the previous council that we needed to increase taxes 25% to our residents. And that this was the budget we were handed. When you first walk through the doors, you're handed a budget that you're supposed to approve right there, right then and then. And with my background and with um, one of our other counselors, Stephen Hanley, who's, who's a very, very proficient financial professional, we kind of said, well, let us kind of look at the numbers and, and see, you know, what makes sense to do something so rash. Uh, and, and very quickly, we were getting extreme resistance from our staff. And they did not want us to look into the, into the numbers, look into the past, look into why they were suggesting that it was so high that we needed to raise these tax dollars. And, and, and to make a long story short, um, <clears throat> We not only reduced that $5 million that they wanted us to add into that budget, we further reduced it another $4 million. Um, and without cutting any services, we actually identified that we believed we could cut a total of uh, about $15 million off the budget uh, when we first reviewed it, which in our world, um, that's a lot of money. Our budget is not as big as obviously the city of Calgary or, or Vancouver. Um, but so we were looking at, 30 to 60 percent reductions in budget and you go well that's not even possible that just can't happen and we believe that it could um, however we were wow. we wanted to be conservative um, even though we were wanting to cut cut wasteful spending and so we said fine we will reduce the budget we won't add the gain the five million dollar gain and we'll reduce it to four million dollars that we believe we can definitely put through the rest of the money we will um, force that to go into a savings account and then if the if the staff really, truly need it, they can come to council and they can ask for access. But we're not just going to let it go carte blanche and just go spend and tell us how it went. Um, and, and we're quite critical of the way a lot of budgets work in government. So if they don't if they don't spend it, um, you know, they think they're going to lose it or something like that. And and we have to take a more proactive approach that this is taxpayers money. We have to respect that. And what, what I noticed, and I'm, I'm guilty of this as well, when I was um, not in government, I really didn't pay a lot of attention to the government. You know, I felt that I couldn't change anything. So, you know, I, I'm forced to pay taxes, so I'll pay my taxes. And, you know, I'll move, I'll just do that and get back to helping working with my kids and my family and my work. Um, and so what I was surprised to learn, though, when I got in office was the apathy that, um, that employees had towards residents and taxpayers. And I said, well, that's new. I always thought that, you know, they know that we're the boss and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they, the, 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 the attitude towards spending taxpayers dollars was, was really poor. They had no concern over trying to save money or anything. When we first got in, we identified that we had, um, we had a hundred and we had 60 visa cards and we had 120 staff. So every second staff had a visa card. And so when they told us this, we asked we asked them, we said, okay, so do you reconcile these visa cards? And they said, of course, every month. And I said, fantastic. Um, can you provide counsel immediately the reconciliations for the last six months? And of course they couldn't um, because we knew that they weren't telling us the truth. And that, that this was a, standard situation that we were experiencing when we first got into office. The amount of uh, misinformation we were being given by our senior staff was incredible. So we very quickly cut up about 54 of those cards and left the city with six visa cards. And then we came back and started adding back in a controlled fashion. Um, and then one of the other thing we noted was we had 300 uh, cell phones. And again, as I said, we had 120 staff. So do you need a different cell phone per the hour of the day or something like this? Um, and so again, not all 120 staff need a cell phone. <laughs> you know, we, we wow. counted approximately 40 did. The rest of them were sitting at their desks. So they don't need cell phones. So it just shows of the apathy that, and the, the towards taxpayers money. Um, and the staff just 
didn't care. They just, it's just there to spend and it is what it is. Get my job done and whatever happens, oh, sorry, just wasted that money. Didn't even apologize about that. They would just waste money. I had a quote that I'd asked for because I didn't trust them on buying a TV for me. I said, I want to get a quote for a TV for our boardroom so that we can do presentations on it. And I asked for something like a 70 inch TV, which is, you know, reasonably inexpensive these days. They came back with a quote for a hundred thousand dollars. And I said, you got to be kidding. I know you were in the office here. I was saying, don't waste taxpayers money. Go get an inexpensive TV, you know, that's going to work. So all we got to do is present. And, um, they were serious. They brought back this quote and I just, I just was getting kind of tired actually about this conversation every day coming into uh, into the office and whatnot about how they were doing something absolutely incredible poorly um and so i ended up grabbing the cao and and we went shopping to best buy and we bought and he bought a 1300 dollars 80 inch tv for our boardroom table and it works perfect i mean it's not a movie theater we're there to show we don't really show sound i mean we're there to show pictures and we want to do our presentation to various, you know, people, diplomats, whoever, um, in regards to whatever we're talking about. So it's got a very finite focused task and that's all it needs to do. And that's what it did very well. Um, and so this was, but the attitude towards this, and this was the second TV that they had spent a hundred thousand dollars on. The one was done previous to us in the previous administration. And they were pretty proud of it, that they had done this. Um, and they talked to us about it at, and it was at community, operations which is your public works <clears throat> and during our tour they showed us this setup and we were like yeah that's impressive um oh. why would you be wasting taxpayers money like that when you guys are getting your oh what goodness. seminars kind of a you know what are you doing um and that was that was the kind of the attitude that staff had towards everything and but that was a cultural change that we we wanted to focus on. And, and we we tried to talk to them about, listen, um, yeah, I'm from the private sector, so I've worked on, on boards of companies um, uh, and y you're very cognizant and aware of your investors and of your um, shareholders. And you have a duty and responsibility to manage things effectively or they will fire you. Um, and so that attitude is the same perspective that I look at it as the taxpayers and the city is the taxpayers hired the, these people to do their job and they want them to do their job as efficiently as possible, um, accomplish goals in a timely fashion, but at the same time, um, you know, make sure that they don't waste their tax dollars because you're trusting us politicians and the administration to say, when we need this much money, that we really truly need it um, and that we're somewhat skilled in making that statement or that determination. And that's what became very shocking for us. So in our first year, we were able to um, save this $15 million. Of that $15 million included the tax reduction um, of $4 million. It also included $5 million of new city, of new councillor spending, which we, for example, hadn't had any additional RCMP since 2014. We added four more RCMP plus their equipment for a million dollars. We had back pay that, um, that the federal government had downloaded to all of the municipalities on the RCMP. So we had a million dollars that we paid. Um, and we also had, uh, we hired six new firefighters and equipment for another million dollars. And so remember the city was broke and yet we were doing all of these things. And, and it's not that, I mean, I didn't really have anything negative about it at all. It was, we were happy that we were able to find the dollars very simply, uh, as well as save taxpayers money. And in our second budget, we were there for two years, we reduced taxes 25%. And we still had put money away to save. And so it, it shows people that government has run extremely inefficiently. Um, and and the what we were most surprised with, well, I shouldn't say most, there were so many, what we were surprised with was um, there was no KPIs. There was no goals and targets that the, when we were trying to set budgets and performance uh, indicators, we were trying to determine, okay, what's the industry average? Where should we be trying to hit? What are our goals specifically for ourselves? And what we were very shocked with was that there's no standardized accounting between municipalities so that we can compare ourselves. And you're like, 
you that just doesn't make any sense municipalities are are some of the oldest entities there ever it has been and so you should have lots of record lots of trends lots of patterns that we should be able to follow and show and, and prove that we can do better um anyway so we went to municipal affairs and we said to them that you know we think there should be standardized accounting between all municipalities and and can we make that an initiative and they said nope never going to happen and you're like well our group is a business group and with our counselors that we brought in sorry when they got elected they were very very business folk business minded people and so for them reading the financial statements was reasonably straightforward um however what's what you can't tell is what's behind the financial statements and that's where the staff did not want us looking and so they did everything they could to block us they even sought a, a legal opinion to stop us from getting access to information in the city. And fortunately for us, um, even though that was a rogue lawyer of ours, he actually said, no, you can't stop the uh, council from getting access to this information. So um, that was refreshing, but we didn't find out about that until two months later because the staff never told us. <laughs> um, and so <clears throat> what getting to some of the corruption, if you, if you, if I may, when we first walked through the doors, um, which was a few days late because our staff was playing games with our us getting our orientation done, and you can't walk, you can't really take over until you get your orientation done. Um, when we first got into my office, the entire office was crystal clean. There wasn't a piece of paper, a pen, a file, a, a file, no electronic files, no paper files. Nothing in the computer had been completely wiped dry. All of the emails were deleted. Everything was gone. <clears throat> and so you can imagine how that's, one, illegal. Two, doesn't help with any continuity of service. I'm assuming the previous mayor did something. Um, however, I had no evidence of anything being done. And we later found out that the manager of IT allegedly had deleted all of the files, all the electronic files, the server files for the emails of the mayor and the CAO. Um, and uh you know which obviously screams what the heck is going on um and we brought this all to municipal affairs and uh and again they they weren't interested in, in looking at it in within our month um we had our cao which was an interim cao because we fired the, the cao that was there because he had been bullying the previous council and holding back information um and so in our interim cao um had come into my office and we had two of the counselors actually that are on the program today. Um, we had them sitting at a table and he said to us that he would like to uh, ask us for a Mia Copa. And I said, well, what the heck is a Mia Copa? <laughs> um, and I said, are you saying that you want me to forgive past crimes? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> and he said, yes. And I said, no. <laughs> I said, I don't have the authority. I'm a, I'm a mayor. I'm not a judge. Um, I don't have the authority that to pr forgive past crimes of, and this is who? This is staff that wanted to come forward with, with information of criminal activity. And I said, number one, they should absolutely come forward. Um, two, we can bring in the RCMP and, you know, we can have a conversation about this stuff. And I'm sure if they come forward, they would be treated fairly. Um, and so he wasn't happy with that. And without skipping a beat, his next question, his next statement was, is that he wants to pay out some hush money. And I said, uh, <laughs> what? what do you mean you want to pay out hush money? Um, who are we trying to hush? <laughs> and so he had asked to pay out hush money for a CFO and, and a director of HR. And I said, you know, we said, no, you can't pay out hush money um we ran on a platform that said we want to find corruption we want to root it out and then we want to increase our transparency the last thing we want to do is hide things that's not our intention at all so he was he was kind of perturbed that we were prepared to um not let him pay out hush money uh and then we found out he was let go about a well, 20 days later and we found out that um, he had paid out almost $600,000 in hush money. 
and he paid just about 400,000 of it to a past an ex CFO. And he paid out uh, about $200,000, just over $200,000 to an ex director of HR. And um, what's, what's interesting is in the government world, that's illegal. In the government world, our budgets are law. So we have to put forward a budget that we all of council has to vote on. That budget is then um, indicates what they're allowed to spend these mil multiple millions of dollars on all these taxpayers dollars, which is which is very you know needed and, and impressive at the same time. However, a CAO who is the head of the city cannot spend any money other than under seventy five thousand dollars without council's approval. So council approved the budget. So if he's trying to spend money outside of the budget that's over $75,000, he has to come to council for approval, which which makes sense. Uh, that 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 makes that lots of sense. So however, he did not come to council for the approval of this almost $400,000 payment and this almost two this over $200,000 payment. And in our records, these people by leaving, they didn't have any special contracts or anything like that. They were due maybe forty to sixty thousand dollars. So the amount of difference is massive. I mean, I would have thought hush money would have been, I don't know, twenty grand, ten grand. I don't know. Um, Three hundred, four hundred grand is like there's a lot of hush going on there. <laughs> wow. We started, and what where this gets kind of crazier Crazy. is we started a lawsuit against these people. We went to the RCMP. And they would do nothing, which is another story I'll tell you about, because they're conflicted and in, and in collusion with some of these people. Um, so we started a lawsuit in the King's Bench in Alberta, in Calgary, against these people. And the, the, the few days after we were let go, December 4th, one of the first things that the Rick McIver did with the administrator that took over our city is terminate that lawsuit and stop it from being um, adjudicated by a judge. And that is absolute massive bias and total judicial inference. Um, but they had a pattern of that, is we had um, very early into our, well, not, I guess, quite early, September uh, 2022, we had put together an investigation report <clears throat> that we were asking a, a third party investigator to investigate. And in this report, it identified so many things. Um, it identified these three rogue counselors that had been um, breaching conduct and doing things that going around the mayor, going around the CAOs, um, all of these kinds of normal bad things <laughs> um, and uh, investigating that. But what it also had was it had evidence of them trying to take the city down at the same time. They had gone to um, our bank. Our, we had a banker with TD Bank, downtown Calgary, to try and see if they could get them to call our loans to destabilize the city so that our, our, um, our success as counselors would be impacted. Um, they also tried to, to coerce our, our uh, IT company, our outside IT company, to, to stop us from getting access to information. And we have records of all of this stuff, so it's pretty wild. Um, they also uh, were working with our, our auditor, KPMG, uh, and they were able to get KPMG to put down their pens two times during our audit. Now the audit, first audit when we got in was for 2021. We were really not in power at that time. That was the previous council. And yet when we brought irregularities to KPMG, the auditor, they would not investigate them. And they would put their pens down if we were gonna if we were gonna do that, and we were like, "Well, what do you what do you mean by that? Why are you putting your pens down? I assume that means you're gonna stop. And why would you stop? You're supposed to be an auditor. Get going and audit." Um, what we then learned was was there was some collusion going on between alleged collusion, I should say, between the ex mayor, the ex CFO, and the ex CAO, and KPMG and our three counselors. Um, we, we had found out just before that, that the ex mayor was the brother-in-law to Rick McIver, the minister of municipal affairs. And so, you know, all of this stuff is like a movie, you know, like a, like a novel about how things are this not supposed like to be. This is like a movie for sure. This is like a movie. Wow. I'm riveted. Keep going. And, uh, so when they put their pens down, we were like, 
you know, whatever, you know, if you're going to be corrupt, you know, we'll, we'll get, we'll take care of you at some point here um, and take them to court and, you know, get them, get them dealt with legally. What we didn't know at the time, because this was our first term, is that if you don't finish your audit, the government of Alberta does not give you your grants. And so that adds up to, you know, about $10 million for us. So as a small city, that's a lot of money. And so we went, had to go to a different auditor to get um, our audit done. However, they have to get a signed release from KPMG that they can proceed. KPMG wouldn't provide that for months and months and months. And so we went to um, Municipal Affairs and said, this is the problem that they're doing. We need to you know, move forward in a different fashion or get something from you that allows us to move this forward. And they would not do that. So we had to wait um, until we could negotiate with KPMG to get this release letter, even though they had resigned. This is like boggles my mind that we had to get this. Um, we got it and then we finished that audit um, and we finished the next audit properly too. But that was later on in our term, closer to the end of our second year. And we were very lucky because TD Bank moved our accounts from Calgary to Toronto's problem account division, cut our lines of credit down to only what was borrowed. So we almost had no flexibility within the city debt wise um, and, and or grants as well. But fortunately for us, we had restructured the city before that. And so we had excess capital that we were putting in the bank. So we actually didn't need what they were offering as much as, of course, you want the money. You can do more recreation, you can do more something. But um, it wasn't what we had budgeted for. We had every penny that we budgeted for and we had more savings. So that was just additional savings that we were going to get. Um, and so this probably ticked them off because we were able to withstand this attack this plot that they had against us, um, and and it was it was shocking. So in that investigation document that I was referring to, we had that information in there that showed all of that mischievous work, and then on top of that, <clears throat> we had evidence of our three counselors, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, colluding with the RCMP. Uh, they were trying to go after one of our CAOs and present fraudulent information that they had uh, that they had manipulated to try and make it look bad, and we brought it into our. They brought it into our one of our um, uh, in camera meetings, and those are the public can't see, and they're not recorded. And of course, they know this, which is something we changed because we want everything recorded so that people can be held accountable. Mm -hmm. Uh, which we now record our in-camera meetings. Um, so nonetheless, they tried to fraudulently uh, present a scheme that that said this CAO should be fired. And they presented some data and whatnot that had was supposed evidence of, of his wrongdoing. And quite quickly, Councillor Hanley and I were able to go through the properties of the document because it was an electronic document and look into the cell formulas because it was an Excel file. And we realized that this was, you know, this was a setup that this was a standard document that was from the city and not created as they had as they had indicated. Fortunately, these these counselors really don't understand what they're doing. So what they were saying made no sense. And so they kind of got got tripped up in their own fact of their lack of knowledge. And very quickly, we identified that they had fraudulently made this up and that this was a whole scheme. And we brought it and we confronted them with this in this in camera meeting. And one of the counselors, Councillor Shannon Dean, came forward and said, oh, I never I never seen this before in my life. This is the first time I saw it. What we later found out is he's the one who forwarded it to Councillor Ryan, who then sent it to all of us in that council meeting that day. He had received it from the RCMP and the RCMP should never have had it in the first place. Right. It was all this scheme these guys were trying to do to try and get the CAO fired because they believed it was. Um, this guy was against them or something, and he wasn't. He was a he was a very knowledgeable, tough guy that was that was very by the book, and and he was nobody's uh, best friend, if you will. Um, he he was just a good CAO, uh, and that was it. So it had evidence of that in there, and it also had evidence of the collusion with the municipal affairs and the RCMP and these three counselors. And so this investigation would have investigated. Not only the three councillors, it would have investigated the RCMP. It would have investigated municipal affairs and Rick McIver. 
And they didn't want that to happen. And so long story short, within 20 hours of us bringing this report to the public and forward, they put in an administrator and terminated the investigation. And we had been trying to get that going for the last you know, two years. And then within the last week and a half before we were uh, removed, we were able to get another third party administ uh, investigator, Myers Norse Penny uh, investigative branch. And as soon as we got the documentation to them, we were let go a week and a half later. And they, they stopped the investigation again for a second time. And so any of the investigations that would show the corruption of, of municipal affairs, Rick McIver and these other um, characters, they were stopping as, as quick as they could. Um, and we had brought, brought this stuff to the RCMP as well. And they confirmed that there is no way that municipal affairs should have been talking to an RCMP officer and or that RCMP officer talking to municipal affairs. They're supposed to be completely separate and that if they ever did talk, it would be way above their pay grade. And in the documentation that we have, Director, or sorry, um, Deputy Minister of Municipal Affairs, Gary Sandberg, was caught saying that he doesn't want any um, any communications to be in writing. He wants it only on his personal cell phone. <laughs> And it's like, well, geez, if you're creating, if you're finding evidence from the RCMP against all these terrible things we're doing, don't you want the evidence? Don't you want it in writing? Like, send it to me right away. Um, yeah. And it, it just goes to show you that the, the, the kind of crap that goes on is, is super, super disappointing. And so we had been in this fight with municipal affairs from, unfortunately, roughly about a month and a half after we got elected. Um, but our focus was on accomplishing our goals. And so we had to, you know, we put in 12 hour days to make sure we hit these targets and we're able to still save money. We're able to get projects done um, and try and, and try and stop corruption. And, and we were very successful in doing that. And we came up with a strategy with my background in construction. I had been taken advantage of as well. I'd learned the hard way <laughs> that um, I had some staff that did kick a kickback against me for, I don't know, for at least a year. And I found out about two years after that they had done it. And what they had done is that they, they worked with a trade that we were working with and they came to me, the trade came to me and said, you guys need to do this and it's going to cost X amount, X amount of dollars and it's more than what it should be. And I'm like, geez, that makes, that sounds expensive, you know, and this was millions of dollars more. So it's not minor. Um, and my staff, who I said, are you guys sure? And these guys are 25 years in the business. So they're, they were not slouches at all. I said, do you guys really think this is important? Do we really have to do it this way? And they came back and said, yes, yes, we have to do it that way. I'm like, wow, we didn't budget for that. Geez, we're going to have to figure out a way to find, you know, another millions of dollars here. And so, what had happened is you would pay the trade the millions of dollars more and then behind the scenes they would pay the people a fee and we know what's crazy about that is that's even tax deductible <laughs> for the company that pays the fee um and so when we got into office we said very the very beginning i said we're stopping all of our construction projects for the city if the developers are doing it they can do whatever they want but from the city perspective we are no longer in the business of doing that now you can't you can't do that forever, okay? But the point was is that we want to a clear start and stop point and really show the staff that we're doing things different, and then we're going to develop new policies and protocols as to how this is going to proceed. But in that analysis, we also determined because when we were we were stopping construction, everybody's like, "Well, you can't do that." And we said, "So walk us through some of these construction projects." And very quickly, we learned that the city would do the construction first and would wait about two years before they would get the developers to pay for it. And they pay for it in the, in the terms of doing a offsite levy. So, so us city folks go to a developer and say, okay, you owe us this much money in offsite levies for all of this various infrastructure. And they're familiar with that. That's how all cities do it. Um, however, what's how all cities don't do is they don't all have them wait for two years until after. And the reason for that is they don't want the developers questioning the amount. 
Because technically the developer can. He can take us to court and say, that's a wrong number. You got to prove it. I'm taking you to court. But the problem is, is, is what ends up happening is, is the cities are vindictive towards the developer and they will stall their approvals. They will stall their permits. All this costs lots of money. Like a developer, you know, in the middle of their development, if it's a big development, is spending anywhere from $500,000 to a million dollars a month in interest. And so, you know, you're, you're really moving, right? These are hundred million plus dollar projects. So, so you paying, you know, three, $4 million in um, kickback, you're like, whatever, just, just get it done. Let's just keep going. And what ends up happening is that's passed on to the consumer. So that's what causes our house prices to go up so fast is that you're getting all of these kickbacks paid for all this corruption paid for by the end buyer. And honestly, the cities are the worst, one of the worst reasons for inflation because we are very bad at identifying corruption. And so what we did to change that whole scenario is we said, look, stop it. And then when we did the analysis with our staff, we quickly identified that we were banking staff, sorry, banking developers. Because if we're paying for it up front for two years, let's say, we're not recovering the money. Well, why would you wanna use your money? Are we making 25, 30% return? No. So if that developer goes out of business or something like that, we take all of the risk because you can't go and charge another developer for something that happened over in another area. So, you know, our staff were very obstinate against that. They said, no, that's not true. That's not true. And I said, tell you what. And I went up and I drew it on a board and I said, okay, let's take out the city and let's put your name right here. Okay. You're going to lend the money over here and you're not going to know if you're going to get your money back and we'll give it back to you in two years, maybe and at no interest, would you go for that? <laughs> and so very quickly they went, okay, no, no, I wouldn't. And they had been doing it this way for, you know, forever. And when I was developing, nobody ever wrote me a check from a municipality. They never paid for my infrastructure. Um, that would have been great. Uh, hey, go ahead, do some more, that's perfect. Um, so what happens is, is that that's where we identified how the corruption is starting. Is wow. that well? Why would you want to bank developers? That makes no sense. Like our cash flow is is getting killed, as the city, and so we stopped that. And so all of a sudden, the city had a whole bunch more cash flow. And so we said to the developers that guess what? Everything you need, touch, or affect, you're paying for, all of it right now. So they weren't very happy with it. But what could they say? You know, I was like, guys, you know what I'm talking about. I never got a check. You're not getting a check. That's over. And so they really didn't push back too much about that. But in that analysis, we identified, because everything about us initially was numbers. It was all finance. So we were always looking at the numbers because everything is always about money for corruption. And we wanted to become more efficient and more effective, which is all about numbers. <laughs> so our focus was massively about that. So we said, explain to us you know, everything. So one step at a time, explain everything that you do to us in a methodical fashion. And so we went through offsite levies, for example, which is all kinds of projects that the city would be involved in or the city wants to happen with relation to a developer. And so you're talking some small, some huge monstrous projects. And so we said, you know, let's understand your, your financial calculations. You know, why are you doing it the way you're doing it? And very quickly, we actually identified that they weren't charging them enough. And our residents, not, not all of them, some of them criticized me for being a, develop, a past developer saying that, oh, these are your developer friends and you're going to give them good deals and all this. And I said, what? <laughs> I said, don't you want me on your side of the team so that we actually know what they're trying to do and not trying to do? Um, and so what ended up happening is on our offsite levies, uh, we increased the offsite levies by 35%. Well, that's huge. Like to one developer, that was 20 extra million dollars. So they weren't very happy about that at all. <laughs> wow. But I said, this is real dollars and we can't be left with the risk. What do we get out of it? If, if this goes wrong, we're paying? Why? For what? It's your development. We're not doing that. So they accepted that. But I did say, what I will do for you, though, and we talked about this through council, was we want you involved and your expertise involved in the design and development of the infrastructure, which they had not been involved in because the city wanted to keep that uber quiet and confidential so that they could do their secret little stuff. Um, and I said, why would we want to do that? I said, the developers have 
all of these huge companies working for them. Their bench strength in those companies is massive. Their numbers of engineers and specialists. I mean, why would we not want to do that? And for one clear reason, we don't pay for them. The developer does. So bring that developer to the table, bring that engineer to the table and have them help and actually take over and develop this infrastructure and design this infrastructure to the best of its it can possibly be done. Our engineer can still oversee it in the sense of making sure quality is kept to standard and, and it's done in, you know, in the right fashion to make sure long term it works for us because we are concerned about that. Um, anyways, long story short, we had one project that was a stormwater project that was being done underneath a, a road we call Rainbow Road that we were going to twin. And it had been held up for years. There was there was two issues with it. It had a it had a 15 million dollar lawsuit that the city you know couldn't negotiate. Um, and it also had this $17 million cost to this underground storm, which was substantial um, for that amount of road. So that we had it redesigned by the developers engineers and they ended up coming up with a new design that saved $5 million on that $17 million project. That's huge, that's huge. So the developers now were starting to believe in what we were talking about. <clears throat> that we want them at the table because it shows it shows um, it, it shines light on the pro on the process. And when you have an expert sitting there, when they're looking at what the costs are, they go, well, that's not right. Or that is right. And all of a sudden, the opportunity for a kickback and padding that project elim is eliminated because it just doesn't make any sense. We had a dog park, not very exciting, but we had a dog park come to us that we wanted to build. And we said, okay, staff, go get the, go do the process, go to the RFP, which is a quoting process and come back to us. They came back to us for one dog park, just the chain link fence for $475,000. And we said, well, that was a little more than we expected. Um, and I said, wow. well, in my background, I've done about three kilometers of black chain link fence. So it's 19 to $21 a linear foot. I don't care for the last 15 years. So your pricing is like $80 what a linear. The heck so said, what the heck is going on? Um, and so we went through their procurement process and, you know, and it was antiquated and they, they don't, they don't go out and get, they don't go out and solicit bids. They just simply put it in the computer mm. and walk away and come back. And I said, well, that's not how we do it in the public, in the private sector. Uh, we go out and try and get best prices for stuff. Anyways, long story short, we ended up doing redoing the quoting process and we came back at $75,000 and we ended up building three for a total of 100 and, under 170 grand. And, and what that identifies is the way that they look and the way they waste taxpayers money. Um, and and that sh whether that person was corrupt or whether they were incompetent, one of the two is the situation and nothing is good. And one of the things that we identified very early is that we need to increase the knowledge and skill base of our staff. We were able to triple our performance in our city, which is which is measured by um, the amount of uh, permits and whatnot that we put through uh, the city. We were able to triple that with 25 percent less staff and more than the city had ever done in the history of its city. Um, and it was all because we got rid of staff that really weren't interested in working we had found staff that had been overlooked that had not been promoted and we kind of said why haven't you been promoted you're exceptional at what you do um and we found out that well they weren't with the in crowd you know that uh that somebody you know wanted wouldn't say yes i guess to everybody all the time so we promoted staff from within and we also found expertise on the outside but that expertise was found from the private sector we did not want government sector people because the work ethic isn't fast enough. And in the private sector, you know, they're used to, you know, it doesn't stop at four o'clock. You know, wow. you keep going. If you've got a thing due tomorrow. Guess what? I'm, We're staying. I'm, I'm just listening to all of this, Jeff. And I'm thinking, well, I wonder if you could just come to British Columbia and actually run our city. And we would love at least the decent people that I know would love to see somebody that's stepping in and doing everything you're doing what you're describing is shocking it's really disturbing and i I'm, I'm wondering how the people of uh chestermere feel that that this has happened to you because 
you were like with all of this, I would be irate if my mayor had been removed and aren't you elected? How do you get removed? And we want to bring in your friends, um, uh, Mel and, uh, and Stephen here, but like, how do they remove you when you've been elected by the people? Well, and that, and that still is a concern, um, is that in, in Alberta, we, we our pr province uh, passed legislation to have a recall legislation, which allowed the citizens to uh, put forth a, position, a petition to look into recalling an elected official. Uh, in Chestermere, that never happened. In Chestermere, there was no recall petition, not, not, not even one that started, not one that didn't pass, not one that didn't get enough votes, not even one that started. And so it's, it's even worse that you've got, you've got a person that's got a, f a family tie to the ex-mayor that was being investigated for some of these issues. And then he, he, I sent him a letter saying, you're in complete breach of the Alberta Conflict of Interest Act right here section i think it's section two um you cannot be a part of this you can't he, he wrote me a reply back which i which we should um i can't show it today but we have in our records that says that um, not to worry that he takes his, his job seriously and that he will um do his utmost to uh you know accomplish it properly and i said that's not the test rick hmm. the test is not you deciding the test is us deciding you're the one in conflict. <laughs> right. It doesn't like, look good at all. <laughs> wow. So if we bring so, in um, Stephen and Mel, uh, yes, what? Please. So so how? Hello, gentlemen. Thanks for waiting in the background. I think we understand. And I guess you all can corroborate everything he said, because honestly, that is like if this is going on in a little tiny town, uh, what do we do about people like that are running the country that have all of these millions of dollars to hide and waste as well, that they don't care about us, you know? So how do you gentlemen tie in? Maybe, um, maybe Jeff, actually, you could help us to understand that initially and, and uh, we'll have a word from them. Yeah, I'll ask a word from each of them. Um, so I'll start with Stephen Hanley. So Stephen, um, if you could just explain your background a bit and then um, maybe... You know, one of those the stark example that we said about the Harry Harry Harker coming in and talking to us that day. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm I'm a retired uh, senior financial partner for Canadian National Railways. Uh, when I started with the railway, I was young. It was uh, a crown corporation, uh, and the government sold it off. Uh, during that time, it went from the worst performing railway in North America to the best performing railway in North America. Now that was done with a lot of people, a lot of very intelligent people who knew how to do things, knew how to operate a business properly and learned how to instill shareholder value into its employees. Uh, when I retired, I, I came to Chestermere uh, and, and you started to meet your neighbors and stuff like that. And as Jeff uh, pointed out, there was a petition back in 2016. There's been, been a number of issues. Uh, there was a lift station that was built that was originally planned for 8 million, ended up costing 25 million, uh, works at 4% capacity. There was all of these things. Uh, so my neighbors, when they found out what I had done for a living, they said, you know, can you look at all of this information? So I looked at the financial statements. I looked at the information on council. I was retired. I had the time. And I realized residents had a right to be pissed off. Um, they just didn't know how to articulate it. Uh, they went through things where their taxes increased 300%. Uh, with that petition, one of the things uh, that we noticed initially coming into office was after that petition, uh, the ongoing council at the time, no one ran again, right? But before they actually left the office, they changed the unanimous shareholder agreement for a utility company. That's right. Then, you know, uh, Rick MacGyver's brother-in-law is parachuted in the, the next election. There's some hope in the residents. They soon realize that that's misplaced. Uh, we come into office uh, on the utility company because that's been a, a question of residents for long outstanding terms, and they won't give us any information. They tell us, oh, you're not members of the board because they've created the company, a separate company, so it has its own independent rights that the that's it's not subject to public transparency 
we appoint ourselves to the board and say, start asking, asking questions. And they say, oh, before you do this, you have to sign all of these confidentiality, non-disclosure agreements, right? And we read, read them and we're going, we're not signing these. Uh, oh, you have to, it's in the unanimous shareholders agreement. Well, we represent the unanimous shareholders, right? Uh, and they, they argue with us. And then we say, we have business experience. We've been involved in this before. So we said, okay, we're gonna go into recess for this board meeting. All the councillors are there. We have a, new, a special council meeting. We open the council meeting. We bring up the unanimous shareholders agreement. We, you know, unanimously strike all of the non uh, non disclosure clauses to and you know provide that transparency back to the public. Then we go uh, and close our council meeting, and we come out of recess for our board meeting, and we go next. The next day, the head of the utility company resigns. Uh, he, in his resignation letter, he reminds us of how he's indemnified against any wrongdoings for his whole term there. Wow. <laughs> and and this, these are, these are things happening to us in, in the first two months. Right. And then, then to be asked, as Jeff talked about, about, uh, Mia Copas and paying out hush money, right. We're, you know, are you trying to make us complicit after the fact or whatever it's, you know, as it, as it evolves. You know, you, and you talk to people about it, people think this, this can't be right. But just more and more crazy stuff keeps happening constantly. Uh, and we saw that uh, throughout our whole first two years that we were in office. My Very goodness. So, I, I mean, people must be irate. And I hope that your story is getting out and that the people of Chestermere actually will will rise uh, in defense. And like, we can't be silent in the face of all this happening. This is like a, a, it definitely is like a movie. It's like a novel, you know, and you wonder what's going to go wrong next. Uh, and well, and I, thank goodness you guys were honest people. I, I think part of it is uh, we've faced a big challenge with the whole uh, municipal inspection and the report. The report is all on hearsay. Uh, the provincial government basically has the media, like the yes. very slanted viewpoints. Uh, that, that come out. Um, half the time, they're, we're reading news articles about uh, ministerial orders or comments uh, or letters that we've been given, and we haven't even seen them yet. Uh, but we're reading them in the newspaper. So it's leaked out in advance. Uh, and uh, then under, you know, the term, so you're the public officials, you're not necessarily supposed to be criticizing the you know, the, the government criticizing, you know, individuals or, or whatever at the time, which was part of the problem. As we're going back through the problems or the the issues that Chestermere's had in the past, there's people in the community that think that we're looking at or gunning after them when we're really not looking at that at all. We're looking at what went wrong and how do we fix it? How do we change the policies, the procedures to prevent it from ever happening again? Right. Wow. But there were a, a lot of naysayers in the community that will support the provincial view. They'd rather the corruption. <laughs> stay. As taxpayers, who would be against the way that you guys are trying to do things? Uh, you know, a lot of people <laughs> finding themselves in a lot of trouble right now, like just buying groceries and to find out that all these millions of excess and, and that nobody wants accountability and you're not allowed to, you know, have disagreement and there's no accountability, it sounds like. And you guys came in to give that and you found out what happens. And obviously this machine is, is strong enough and it has enough power to actually get you guys taken out of an elected position. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and I think that's something else that had come up. We, we, when we started investigating and finding out all these strange things that were happening, we had found that municipal affairs had obtained a legal opinion on November 8th. We were only in office. Uh, our, I think our first council meeting was October 26th. So within two weeks, there's a letter uh, from uh, Brown Lee to deputy minister because the minister is asked for what are the steps and what power do I have to remove a sitting council? And the lawyer says, uh, you have no steps or right to do so. Uh, what you have is you have an inquiry, a municipal inspection. The city must be found being run irregular, uh, in, uh, improper and improvident. Uh, you can only remove councillors if they 
disobey a ministerial order. So you have to go through this process, which requires a high degree of procedural fairness. You can't do it by decree. Uh, and then you issue your orders and the orders have to be to your satisfaction. And if they're never to your satisfaction, then only then can you actually come forward, <laughs> which is questionable as well. Uh, like I understand the province has the ability to create and incorporate cities to amalgamate cities or dissolve cities back into the counties. Uh, but as far as to remove elected officials, that's a constitutional right people have to vote for whoever they feel will best represent their interest uh, in the democracy. This right? is absolutely and, crazy. And as Jeff said, there was recall legislation uh, and no one ever attempted that. And there was a petition, you know, in 2016 uh, with 5,500 uh, signatures on it. Uh, nothing was happened. Nothing happened. Here we get, uh, you know, disgruntled people or people that may have been involved in some of the issues in the past or people who just felt the election didn't go their way and were upset with us writing to Municipal Affairs, who was more than happy to do so because of what the types of things we were uncovering. It's so disturbing. Um, I, I'm very alarmed and I'm concerned about what what kind of people you were actually working with. And if this is systemic through our entire um, Canadian country, that this kind of thing is going on and people are all getting kickbacks. And, you know, it explains a lot about why we feel like we can't understand why we're millions of dollars in debt. I was just showing JT um, here, like Ottawa is to launch a $6 billion infrastructure fund to help build homes with strings attached. I bet there is. I bet mm -hmm. there is, if, there, <laughs> if there's this much corruption in the tiny city of 30,000 um, in, in Alberta, in, yeah. in a, a, this is a, a conservative area, a God-fearing, yeah. wonderful people. And if this is I going on, what, what else is wrong? Yeah. I, I think, you know, the, when we've gone to various conventions and things like that, there is a lot of other mayors and council representatives who have, you know, come to us, have approached us, asked, how do you do things? And it's really just about asking the question uh, and keep asking questions until you get the answers that you deserve. Uh, so, Mel, yes, go ahead. I think that happens... Uh, from a financial point of view that we talk about when we, we go uh, on, on some live events is years ago, uh, people will remember uh, companies like Enron. Now, Enron, when they first started, they didn't set up to be a, a financial disaster, but they took one step over the line and nothing really happened, right? Something that was unethical. So then they take another and so on and so on until you get to a point where it's corrupt and the, the shareholders cannot trust the organization. As a result of those financial failures, the Canadian government, the U.S. government, they instituted Sarbanes-Oxley controls in businesses to ensure investor confidence. With those types of controls in all your business processes, which are like the policies and the procedures that we're talking about to fix things in the municipality, things like that Arrive Can app would have never happened. It would have been flagged long before. But yeah. the one key note is the government yeah. knows how to fix it, but they do not apply any of those rules to themselves. So that's actually maybe what, what's coming out of all of this is that uh, regular rules, uh, accountability, checkpoints, none of that's happening. I mean, where is all the money going that you guys didn't catch? Like when you, when you say that a fence is going to be 400 and some thousand, and you did it for 78, how, how, what were they, where was it all gonna go? Like, the, is somebody lining their pockets? And I mean, these are serious things to be, people have to ask questions. Maybe people need to go to jail, I don't know. Something seems very wrong. And I don't wanna forget well, about Mel, cause he's waiting, but yeah. sure, go ahead, finish up. Did you wanna I, finish on the, one the? Yeah, one of the biggest things that we did is governments have the ability through in public sector accounting through restricted surplus accounts to orchestrate their books. If I don't spend the money, restricted I can put it in on the balance sheet. I can do an accrual. Uh, and this is something that, uh, you know, they they flow through. And from a budget perspective, 
by us saying nothing gets added or removed from these restricted surplus accounts without council's authority was probably one of the biggest drivers of us uh, coming up with all of these savings. Because uh, even if the project was underspent, they could turn around and put that money in a restricted surplus account and use it at a later date for something else. Wow. You know, we're, we're Sarah, just shocked. Is- we're shocked. Like just uh, me and my producer here, you know, chatting about all of this. Um, we're, we're like, this is so huge. Like what you guys are doing and the courage it takes to do what you're doing. This should be busting up. And it should put people in fear across the country that good men like yourself had better start showing the truth of what is going on in our cities. It's it's terrible. Well, and that restricted surplus account that Stephen mentioned uh, yeah. is a, a huge issue. Uh, we found that out that these, because in the private sector, there is no such thing because CRA wouldn't let you have that. But in the government sector, because they're not taxed, they were using that as ways to offset gains or losses if you had it. Um, but again, what's it's not something that's reported properly. And then it's also not managed by council. We found out that it was managed by the staff and they didn't have any oversight from council. We said, you've got to be kidding me. And in our city, we had over $10 million in that account. And so as Stephen had mentioned, if a project wasn't done, that that money would go into there. They put it in there. Uh, the councillors wouldn't know about it. And then what would happen is they could either ask for it again for that project next year and not pull the money from that account. And they would have that account as one big slush fund that they had no oversight, didn't have the controls or anything attached to it, and they could go spend it as they saw fit. You're like, absolutely not. Um, and so no this is transparency. One of the How does it work, mm-hmm. Jeff? Like, like the, this is so wrong. I mean, everyone and and taxpayers shouldn't we be able to know how much money you got in the coffer? Yep. It's it's set up to really to really sh- not show you. Um, as Stephen had mentioned, that utility company that was a private entity, wholly owned by the city, they took the attitude that it's a private company. We don't have to share the information with you. You're like but it's owned by the city who's owned by taxpayers. Yes, you do need to show me that information. Um, and and when we when we forced the CEO, as Stephen mentioned, we don't want any more confidentiality clauses, anything. It's got to be able to be shared. They were stopping us from sharing that information, even with city staff. You're like, wow. what? It's, never mind city staff. We wanted the public to see it. So we eliminated all of those confidentiality clauses. And because yeah. we did that, the CEO quit. You're like, wow. And then reminded us that he can't be held liable for anything that's been done during his term. <laughs> oh my word. Like You're something like, smells rotten me? in Denmark, right? Something Absolutely. smells very bad. Absolutely. Like if this is an example of how our cities are being run, how our municipalities, how our government, and clearly we know we're in big trouble. We're trillions of dollars in debt in this country and and we got a lot of problems and and every time you turn around with, with, with all that debt we're able to do the ottawa to launch six billion in infrastructure you know that's right what where like where yeah. where is that money because i thought we couldn't pay for the veterans leg you know i thought that we couldn't help that we we couldn't clear up homelessness we couldn't take care of our own you know and uh, we played a funny clip recently you know with trudeau complaining about um complaining about the uh, the migrants and the the their unusual <laughs> like they're the the temporary students and temporary workers he brought them in he's now complaining about it that it's overwhelming the system you know like somebody's getting their pockets lined and then this guy what is the accountability to hold this guy to to sue him to bring him to a court to make everybody that's doing this accountable to the people what is there no mechanism for this? Well, well that's I, the judicial I, I, Yeah. That we've uh, started. And, but I do think that um, Rick McIver, you should never be able to remove a, a voted in counselor or person um, unless at the very worst case scenario, if the person is completely, you know, doing something absolutely legal, 
it should be more than one person. Everything in democracy is about having multiple people at the table. And him simply coming in and waving his wand um, is just absolutely unacceptable. Um, and I, I should move on. I should ask Mel. Mel, what's your take on, on I guess, the beginning of this? Because you were in two terms. You ran in the previous term wow. and then our term. And, and your access to what did you discover during both of those times? And your background. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Um, when I ran in the last term, I was the guy that, um, I, I guess I should tell you uh, up front, I'm actually legally blind. And uh, I guess, why would I want to get into politics? Well, uh, I thought that I would like to do my civic duty. And so that's why I got into it. Um, when I sat on the uh, previous council, um, I guess I was a, a bit of the guy that uh, would not take the status quo decision um, or plan from the previous council. And I didn't make myself real popular with some of my fellow councillors, but <clears throat> I did know that there is a cheaper way of doing things. And that comes from my background as being a farmer. Uh, I look for the best deal. I just don't look for the first uh, number that comes up. And that's why far farmers are so successful in life and can adapt to so many things. It's because they can change on the fly and make things happen. They look for the best deals on fertilizer, fuel, whatever it may be. And if they can get it, that's great. And if they have to make an adjustment, they make an adjustment. And so that's why I thought myself and uh, uh, Jeff and Stephen Hanley and Blaine Funk would be ideal people to bring into city council. And uh, Jeff and his background is, uh, he's told you about it, Steve and his, and Blaine and, and his uh, logistics background. But I come from a background of agriculture. I come from a background of uh, seed cleaning uh, for, for the farmers. Uh, I spent 20 years in the, in the uh, northern part of Alberta. Uh, I have been on various boards with, uh, with the seed industry. Uh, I was part of writing the Canadian Food Inspection Agency uh, criteria for plant breeders' rights. And so I've had a little bit of background experience there, but I thought when I went blind, I wanted to do something else, and I just wasn't prepared to sit down. And so I guess I feel a little bit responsible here I, I tapped Jeff on the shoulder and I tapped Steven on the shoulder and I encouraged Blaine to run. Said, come along. And be, yeah, come along. And I knew their skills. Um, and the CUI problem was a problem that was already started in my previous term. Um, and they were going to try to merge it into uh, the city. But bless Mr. Hanley, he... And, and, and his wife at the time, bless her heart, uh, she's gone on now, but she, they together, she was an analyst and he was this, uh, the partner of, of CN. They sat down, they had figured out and they came over to my house and they showed me the numbers that they didn't even have proper numbers for the accounting to go on for the next year. They were disregarding a certain part of the, of a certain number and we could not get the previous council to come up with the real true answer what was going on and i pounded on the table saying why not do you pull not pull mr hanley in and his wife uh the accounting firm uh the cui company and sit down and hammer this out I'm, I'm a guy that does not like to go through the court system. I am a, a fairly logical, logical guy. I've, I, I thought we could solve this problem and move on from it, but that wasn't, that wasn't their desire. And so consequently, I kind of got bullied a little bit for my stand on some things and I got broad shoulders and, and I can take it. Uh, but the one thing that I could not take, um, was the city, the previous council, was planning on building a, f uh, a new civic center. And when they started talking about this civic center, 
I thought, this is a pie in the sky, guys. But I thought I'll be open-minded to it because I'm all about recreation for, for adults and children. And so I sat and I listened, and it started along the lines of, okay, we're going to be able to build this thing for $30 million. And a week later, it went to $32 million. And so I brought forth a motion that what was defeated that we stop this uh, project until we have further consultation with the residents. We have final plans drawn because this $40 million thing they were going to build was only basically a, a bit of a soccer field. And I knew Jeff had had experience with that. And so I asked Jeff to come in and explain it to city, uh, to the, to the CAO and the mayor at the time, which he did, but he was just kind of blown away, uh, blown off. So that is what really stirred the pot, I think originally was because I wasn't in favor of that and I, I made, it, uh, made it a bit of an election issue. Good but, for you. But we didn't, we didn't know. We've been told by the CAO and the mayor, oh, we're all ready to go and the uh, Parks and Recreation lady stepped up and she said, in 2023, we're going to be having our first soccer game in this building. And I went and thought to myself, okay, you're telling all this. After we got in, this, the new council got in, we found out that the land hadn't even been subdivided yet. The city didn't even own the land. And there was supposed to be a school site on it. A, an erect center and there was nothing ready and there's a big dirt pile sitting on the school site and all the people were all up in arms in the city because they needed more we need more schools in Chestermere and here we are stuck in this hole that we want to build a school but we can't build a school because we don't have it subdivided we don't we don't even own it and they're wanting to build a civic center with 40 million dollars that we as a city can't afford and so I guess that's that was where where we started to get into things. But I will say um, another portion. I have wrote many emails to Mr. McIver and to the Premier of Alberta wanting to sit down and have a conversation with them. When this thing first started to get to, got going, I said, why don't we sit down together in a room and sit down and try to figure out what the problem is here. And we, I never received one response back from them. And um, I know the premier has to stay out of that sort of thing, but the minister would not even, whenever he would come down and talk to us, all he would do is come down and deliver uh, uh, threats to us. And uh, I, don't, I don't deal in, with threats well. And so that's, that's kind of my instance. And I guess, mm. In the last part of it, the last part of it, uh, we were let go December the fourth, and they have now, Mr. McIver has ordered a forensic audit of the city, and I welcome that. I really do, because we have done nothing wrong. Uh, in, in my heart, uh, I uh, I was raised by the good book: "Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not bear false witness," and so consequently. All of this is not falling in line. And I, I'm very disappointed in that. But the real clincher in this whole thing was, is they, they brought in a, a private investigator yeah. and he thought it would be really, he thought I was a nice guy. And he said, staff thought I was a nice person too. And he said, the residents respected me. And so what he was trying to do is offer me a chance to keep my integrity. And so by keeping my integrity, he wanted me to basically throw my other three colleagues under the bus. And uh, he gave me a few days to think about it. He, he shook me up a little bit. He said, uh, uh, there could be criminal charges or, or uh, civil charges. Um, but he said, we can more likely get you off the civil charges and I said, how are you going to do that? He said, well, the CAO that has been appointed by the government now 
he has that power that he could uh, give you immunity from that. And so I mentioned back to him, I said, I thought only a judge could give you immunity for anything. And he said, oh, no, no, Mr. Vincent has, has the, the, the power to do this. And so then I asked the next question. So does the CA know? Does the, the uh, official administrator know? Does Mickey Amory, the justice minister, know? Does Mike Ellis, the deputy premier, know? And does Mr. MacGyver know? And he said yes to Mr. Vincent and Mr. Lagore, but he wouldn't commit himself on the others. But <clears throat> to me, a judge needs to look at this and uh, it needs to go before a judge and everybody needs to be under oath and it needs to be sorted out that way. Um, I, I don't like the thought of all the expense that is involved with that because I don't like wasting money. But I do know that the three gentlemen that I've decided to uh, support, and I would never, I'd never throw my colleagues under a bus. Uh, but I do know that in my heart, I have done nothing wrong. And if they prove something wrong, that's that's for them to prove. But in my heart, I've done nothing wrong. Wow. And thank you for, for serving um, Canadians. Uh, you know, a lot of people can't do any kind of service and you're blind and you've been standing up and doing the right thing, living by the good book. I'm just wondering how doing a forensic audit is going to help your, and, and how would they even do a forensic audit unless they can get hold of the restricted surplus accounts? Uh, because an awful lot's going on through that. And I hope, I, I'm asking everybody watching this right now to share, share, share. Send it to your MPs and your MLAs and, and your city councillors and your mayors and send it to your friends and ask every Canadian to start to wonder how do we hold our governments uh, accountable and how do we how do we help those like these three good men here who do the right thing and then apparently can't keep your job if you're trying to spend less taxpayer dollars that's what gets you fired in this country i think this is very alarming and disturbing for every single one listening one thing i'd, I'd like to also say um, is that we haven't uh took this job lightly and uh, uh we have figured out a way and we thought possibly Jeff, you can expand on it or Stephen can expand on it, but we have figured out a way that we lowered our taxes roughly about 25 to 30%, but we've actually figured out a way that with all the growth that we're having in within the city and the new tax dollars that we're gonna be able to bring on through commercial and whatever it may be, we could actually lower the taxes even more just about down to to nothing if we wanted to. Wow. Do you know what? Everyone watching is like, do you guys want to live in my town? Do you guys want to come <laughs> and live with us? Everybody's like, these are the rock stars. You know, this is this is absolutely amazing. And you guys are to be commended for what you've been through. Um, like, so Jeff, are they going to try to go after you even more? Well, we... Um as much as they've tried to intimidate us, um, as Mel said, we're not easily intimidated. Uh, they, we did say that we were interested in going um, into the by-election, um, as well as the judge that we uh, recently had, had indicated that she wanted to have the Chief Justice um, have the judicial review heard before the by-election, because she felt that this evidence that we had provided was compelling enough that it, it allowed for a high likelihood of success um, in our in our judicial review. So that's that's encouraging that that would happen. Um, the Chief Justice at this point has not responded to set those dates, but you know it's in his court, I guess. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to mention <clears throat> um, as significant as what Mel was saying 
is that field house project that he was talking about that has a 40 million dollar quote on that which wasn't a fixed price contract um, and i had been involved with a, a construction of a project for, uh, for one of my kids soccer teams was an indoor uh, facility that was seven and a half million dollars and i had presented this information to uh, the council and the only person that was interested in looking at it was councillor fote nobody else would consider that and i i thought that to be very odd because um, soccer, indoor soccer fields are very, very, very similar. They can only be built a certain way because their trusses are so large and wide. Uh, there's not a lot of options. So the construction costs of them are very similar. Now, if you want to add to the front of it, to the front of the building to make it look prettier, you want to put the fitness facility on the front, that's okay. Whatever you'd like to do is over and above that cost. But what we were looking at is this facility is still around seven or $8 million. And we had a third party quote come in here in 2023, um, mid, mid 2023, and it came in at um, about eight and a half million with any of the cost increases. So, you know, these these numbers are real and, and it just shows you that there was a massive corruption, um, potential corruption that was being um, in that initial project that we shut down. And we're still willing to put in a, a field house. Of course we want a field house, but we don't want yep. something that is either A, way over designed, if it's not corrupt, or B is corrupt. And then guess what? Our city was taking out debt, $40 million of debt on that project. And hopefully they're gonna try and get developers to cover some of it after the fact. But again, here you go with the cart ahead of the horse or the horse, yeah, cart ahead of the horse. Is that why are they doing it that way? Why would they want the developers not to pay up front and look at the cost themselves? Um, and so that, you know, that and what Mel had touched on briefly was really an act of extortion by um, this fellow that had, had asked him for a conversation. They tried to bully him. They, tr they threatened him with jail time. They threatened him with all this stuff if he didn't lie for them. And, you know, it's a very traumatic event. Not everybody's used to fighting in the trenches. <laughs> and so when you have people come after you and, and threaten all of these kinds of things, most people are like, wow, this is not where I want to be right now. <laughs> but, you know, and that's what's powerful about the four of us is that we, we all know that we didn't do anything wrong. We already have that information. The forensic study that they're doing, doesn't it seem a little bit odd with all of this allegations of corruption that we've brought forward, all of these history things with CUI, our utility company, that the forensic audit is only going as far back as October 18th when we were elected? Geez, why wouldn't you go back as we've alleged all of this? Well, corruption? that guy says he's you know? not in any trouble, right? That former guy. I'm not in And by the way, as I leave, I just want you to know I cannot be prosecuted for anything that just happened. Okay. That's right. That's uh, right. And, and so is that indemnity yours as well? Like, do you get to claim that, that, you know, that you're not uh, in trouble for anything? Because maybe you got to claim the same thing. It's, it's just wow. absolutely disturbing. Yeah, we're, we're really not worried at all about any yeah. kind of wrongdoing. We absolutely did not do anything wrong. And the way that a city works is that we pass a motion in council that's public, and then that gives direction to staff to do something. And so if that takes the CAO to go spend money in this direction or that direction, they have a certain latitude to spending their budget. I mean, they can't go to Vegas on their budget for a road or something like that. But if the road needs more of something or less of something, they have the authority to make those those minor transitions. So um, this whole idea that we've done something in, in, in wrong is is just it's just utter nonsense. And and really what it is is Municipal Affairs and Rick McIver trying to sow doubt into people's minds. Like I heard him come up with this this concept about how our judicial review has cost taxpayers $300,000. Well, our judicial review was started on December 14th. So, geez, we spent $300,000 in a month? <laughs> like, what do you mean? We were let go on December 4th. So that's not accurate. It's under $300,000. But what that's for is that's for legal advice throughout the year. Now, they don't want to point out that the previous administration spent over $700,000. But it's not accurate for us to say, or even them to say, well, that means the mayor Chalmers, the ex, the ex mayor spent $700,000. That's not accurate. The city spent $700,000, but municipal affairs is totally okay with saying, oh, the mayor spent $300,000 on a judicial review. 
And it's just, it's just nonsense. Um, and, and, and it's frustrating because they play the media and the media is allowed legally, thanks to Justin Trudeau, to lie. And you're like, well, how does that serve the public good that you aren't supposed to find out the truth and present the truth to us residents? Because how the heck are we supposed to find out? Do you know what um, they didn't bank on, Jeff, is they didn't bank on uh, private producers and news gatherers and people that tell yes. the truth like myself. And let me tell you, we have been able to be very so scary to them that they want to bring in this hate laws and all kinds of stuff um, to silence people like myself. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I speak every single day to a mega church. If you want to put it, if you want to put all the people I speak to every single day in a gigantic stadium, that's how many people I speak to. So when we share, share, share the information, uh, it gets to everybody and people start asking questions. And what we need is we need Canadians en masse to begin to say that enough is enough and to stand behind folks like yourself. And I hope that your city uh, folk are standing behind you. Thank you for what you've done and for the truth that you're telling. You're incredible people. And it just, it's a sick world right now where those that do what is right are the ones paying the penalty. And we're seeing it happen all over the United States and in Canada as well. You know, we have political prisoners uh, that, that are going on. And um, there was just a, an offer to one of the final two Coots guys that are in your province. And he said, pound sand, basically. He's not taking a plea deal because he never deserved to be in there. And there's going to be a day of reckoning for what they're doing. So in another area and in, in another way, you guys are standing up for the people. And this is wrong. Can you run again and get back into council? Uh, we definitely can. Um, the only issue is that we've been told that Rick McIver is trying to come up with some manufactured reasons how we could be disqualified from running for council. So um, Rick McIver, huh? There's a name in, in yeah. court, but it would be after the election, after the by-election. <laughs> right. You know, and that's he, yeah. he's just he's just such a. Well, yeah, it looks like you all have a lot of life left in front of you. So, uh, well, we'll go through this election and let's do it for the next one. I mean, something's wrong in our land when folks like yourself trying to save money, not stealing behind. I don't know what's going on. Nobody is accusing anyone of stealing. We're just saying there's a lot of money missing. That's all. So forensic audit yourselves to death because that's exactly what the people want. We want a forensic audit and we want a forensic audit. I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone in Chestermere and every city across Canada. Don't you all want a forensic audit on the restricted surplus accounts that apparently uh, city councillors don't get to know about? You don't even get to have accountability and transparency for it's our money, everybody. It's our taxpayer dollars. You're supposed to be accountable to us for what you're doing. And apparently that's not happening. So I don't like it. I don't like this one single little bit. I'm Canadian through and through. My grandma and grandpa have been here since the 1800s. I have family members in uh, Red Deer. I just found out my grandfather's brother, all my you know related cousins are in the Red Deer area. We are Canadians and we refuse to just bow and to take all of this. And I personally thank you. And I'm asking everyone, just share this. Like just share, share, share. Let's put an end to this. And whoever these people are that think that they're gonna get by because the media is, is not going to talk and do what's right, who cares? Nobody believes the media anymore. Nobody's listening to you. You're paid off, you're bribed. You're, it's disgusting. Uh, the truth tellers, are going to get this information out. They're going to get this story. Thousands and thousands, so. millions, I dare say, of Canadians are gonna hear about what's happening. And we're gonna require in all of our different cities that there be accountability. And I just pray the apathy stops, you know, because that's part of what happens is people go, oh, it's too big to deal with, you know? No, we have to give them the impression and we have to let them know that we're going to write letters, we're going to demand things, we're going to be a big noise and a big pain in the butt to them. So is there any last thing that um, you all would like to say? Yes, please. I'd Steven? like to say. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Stephen? 
Go ahead, Mel. Uh, I I wish no harm on any of uh, of these these people. Uh, even though they, I just hope that they get what is deserving to them. My grandfather gave me a uh, a line a long, long time ago, and Jeff and Stephen have heard it many times, I'm sure. But he, this is my catalyst to keep me working in in life: is idle hands never get hurt. I've came up with a new slogan now, that, now that sitting on Council of Chestermere for uh, for just about six years. It's not the ups and downs that get me in life; it's the jerks in between. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Go ahead, Stephen. Um, yeah, uh, it's it's been quite an experience. Uh, I never expected uh, it to go the way that it has. Um, you know, to to us, it seemed very straightforward. It's uh, as having worked a whole career, and at the end of your career, what you're probably best at is mentoring people, showing people how to do the job right. Uh, and I thought that's really what we're going to be doing here is I have experience, I have knowledge, uh, but just the amount of sheer resistance and the extent that people will go to, uh, to uh, undermine or, or undo everything that you've done. Uh, and they say at times, you know, uh, people don't see their themselves as being evil. They just, uh, and, and I, I start to question of, uh, really the morality of some of the people that are sitting around nowadays. I uh, hear you. I, I question it as well. This is a quite an astounding story. Go ahead. Uh, we'll give you the last word, Jeff. Uh, thank you. One last thing I wanted to say for, for people that, um, they need to support and stand up with their own communities. Cause this is happening everywhere. One, one quick little, uh, um, analysis that everyone can do is that if you divide your, uh, budget for your city, divide that by your population, that'll give you a number of um, on a per person basis of the budget that's being spent. So in Chestermere on your operations budget, uh, we're spending about $1,600 per person, which we could easily drop to 1200 or less. Uh, when you're looking at places like Calgary, they're spending about $2,300. When you're looking at Edmonton, they're about 1800 we have one city called Cochrane, which is spending about $2,600 per person. Mm. And they're about the same size as Chestermere and they're spending about $30 million more. Um, so that just tells you that there's something odd going on there. <laughs> so you can look at your own cities and you can say, what's our operation budget and divide that by your population. And that'll give you what, whether you're doing well or whether you're way out to lunch um, and as Mel said, we did approach Minister McIver about, in our analysis, we said, you know, we could actually reduce taxes to zero. Um, whether that's a good thing, that's a question, but maybe people should pay 10% or something like that. But, but I was like, we are actually able to be efficient enough to run all of our services, run all of our city, still cut the grass, still plow the snow, still pick up the garbage, um, and put money aside for a rainy day and for, um, you know, social programs. And, and really get rid of tax. And it just, it's amazing when you think of it. And he was not interested at all. And I said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, buddy, whatever, whatever. What are you going to do? You know, they, they, just, they just don't like the fact that we're getting rid of their piggy bank. That's what they don't like. Wow. And, and quite frankly, I'm like, listen, enough of you guys spending all of our tax tiers money. Oh, um, man. And, and when you look at the province, you know, the province is the same way. Like every person lives in a municipality. So the municipality is the one that's taking care of every square foot. You know, we have crown land that wouldn't be in a municipality, but and people don't live in crown land though. <laughs> so every place that persons live, a city is taking care of them. A municipality is taking care of them, whether it's small town, big town, who, who names it. And yet the province still has a $70 billion budget. And you're like, wow. So you add that plus you add the municipalities budgets. This doesn't make sense, right? And so there's a lot of questions that need to be answered when you start actually looking at the numbers. I mean, the numbers don't lie. People just don't want to tell you what the numbers are. Um, and hopefully people can stand up. I mean, there's a UCP convention coming in November. Um, there's a good opportunity to put forward some ideas like, like we'd like to put forward a motion for 
standardize the counting, you know, in all municipalities. We'd like to put forward a motion about how um, quoting should be done and make sure it's transparent to all of the people, public yeah. as well as the, tr the developers who have the expertise, because that's where the corruption is happening. That's how you get pools of wealth out of the city. And you can't just go take a check and steal the money. That's too easy to get, get caught. But in a project, you can take the money. And so you've got to stop that and you've got to create transparency around it. And that's at every level. doesn't matter if it's the federal, provincial, municipal, every level, that's, that's, that's how that's done. Mm. I absolutely agree with you. And I'm very grateful to have met you. I consider you amazing Canadians and heroes in the land. And it might uh, be quite costly to do things like this, but you're amazing. And I, I know you're going to get a lot of um, support because people who are honest and have integrity will really value what you've done. So I hope that your fight is good. If you need to bring an update, then uh, let's do an update. If you need to, if we need to keep reporting on what is not being told and the truth of it, you have a friend here uh, and we will definitely help you to do that. It's a staggering story. And I'm sorry, but Chestermere, every person that lives there should be stunned and very upset. And then that upset should spread through the whole country. Thank you very much for very your so. story and Thank your you. courage. We appreciate it very much. Thank you very Take much. care. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Wow. Um, you know, uh, the good book that uh, Mel talked about, living by those principles, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. And I can't help thinking with all of this being really about money and therefore about power, I guess, that it's the love of it that gets us in trouble. It's not just money. Some people are really good people. I mean, these three uh, counselors and, and uh, the, the former mayor, um, these three that have been, you know, ousted because they wanted to potentially, like, don't you think they should maybe be running the country? If, like, if they can say, you know, we could actually bring it, let's say, to no taxes. <laughs> I'm like, do you want to be the prime minister? Okay, because I'm going to vote for you right now, right? We're only getting promises of reduced taxes from Pierre Polyev right now. We're not getting that kind of word. And don't you wonder how that's probably possible, that in a country like this, we shouldn't be under the burden that we are under, that we work, what is it you're always complaining, JT, like we work till June or July before we actually half the year, you know, before we're actually making our own money. And I, I'm, not, I'm not thrilled with what I'm hearing here. It's very disturbing. And I hope that the folks in Chestermere, that you are supporting these guys and that you're beginning to ask more questions, send letters, bang on the door, show up and start saying uh, this, this fellow, Rick McIver. Listen, you might, there's a lot happening that goes on on earth, but be sure your sins will find you out. And Rick, I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong. Just maybe we all got to have a more open, transparent thing happening here in, in our nation, because I don't want this happening in my city and I'm quite certain it is. And until someone in my city, decides that they're going to be as courageous as these guys, it just keeps happening. And I did have a good friend who was a city councilor. And let me tell you, I know some stuff. And it's not good. And we need to find ways, everyone. Standardize accounting. Isn't that simple? We should be, we should be going to our council members in all of our cities and asking for that very simple thing. Also, don't forget restricted surplus accounts where apparently they're restricted and staffers get to have fun with all that. And, and you know, if he wanted a television for the boardroom, everyone knows how much a huge TV is. $1,300. It's, we, we've got them in our homes. We're not, we're not idiots. Uh, we don't need a Megatron 
as you know, they have at some big, like what is going on for someone to even present that with a, 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 a you know, with a, a straight face that, that they would present this. And then if you know how much the chain link fence costs and you've got outrageous numbers, these were the kind of guys that had the guts to stand up to it. It's just shocking. My website is laurelin.tv. You know I love you guys. And I know that the people, they, I know you are outraged. I know you are. And uh, we need to be. We need to be because there's always this dude right over here. Do I still have that being shown there, JT, one more time? Ottawa to launch $6 billion infrastructure fund to help build homes with strings attached. Sorry, I know I'm throwing, I'm throwing, I'm doing an audible. I'm calling an audible. There you go. <laughs> JT taught me about calling an audible, which is a, uh, it's a sports term, right? In football where the, the, what do you call them? The, the play you agreed upon, you change it. Is it the quarterback that would do that? I'm quarterbacking right now. I mean, this guy right here, if I could just, you know, here's a face that we wonder an awful lot about what's been going on. And now we can definitely say, that we've got a problem that really stinks to high heavens in every level of our government. And if you're watching, I know you agree with me because we've been going through an awful lot. Every single week, we're bringing you things that they don't want to talk about. They're not looking heavily and deeply into all of these things that are so problematic. And for some reason, all of our money, it doesn't mean a lot to them. It means a lot to you that your tax dollars are leaving your wallet and in fact, it never gets to your wallet because your employer is just siphoning it off. But it sure means something to us, doesn't it? It means something. And when they are dishonoring us, then I guess we're only able to, you know, to complain and everything when we're willing to stand up and not take it anymore. I'm not, I'm... Mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Remember that guy? He throws the TV out. Of, it's a movie. All right. So laurelin.tv, thank you very much. To all of you, you know that Trudeau is uh, no longer uh, willing to support us. Um, it, he actually never was. So any grants that go to all that media, we don't get them. Thanks for supporting us. Appreciate it. There's a donate button. You can see it on the page there. And if you're willing to um, help us, I've got my book. It's called Relentless Redemption. And if you're willing to become a $20 per month or more supporter, we're going to send this out to you. It's my personal story. You'll be shocked at the lows and the highs and the failure and the, uh, the climb back to, back to where you should be because sometimes there's a few uh, divergent paths along the way. And so my book is all about that. It's a very true tale. Uh, it's written from my gut. And so I want to send that to you. If you are able to become a monthly partner or a one-time donation or send an e-transfer to Laura Lynn Live at protonmail.com, that would be super fun too. And don't forget that, are you going to put that up, hun? Oh, there it is. All right. Oh, and it's Laura Lynn Live at pm.me if you want it to be shorter there you go take a snapshot hold your hold your your uh, camera up. and um we have snail mail box 48184 queensboro new westminster bc v3m oa7 and i can't stress enough i we cannot trust our governments with our funds they're just printing money to do whatever they want and then people that are we're electing into power uh, without men that are honest, without men and women that are willing to stand up to the, the bullying that happens when you try to tell the truth or try to hold anyone accountable, we don't know what they're doing. And, and all of this money, th there's no respect for what's happening to the people of this country. And so we urge you to stand strong. And uh, also, you know, if you're going to do any investments, make it into something that's, you know, hard, like... Uh, you know, gold and silver, Steve Merrill at Sun City Silver and Gold. That's the guy we trust. We squirrel away little bits so that on a day when our meaningless printed paper money isn't really doing the trick, we've got a little bit of gold and silver, and then we'll just cut it into little tiny pieces and buy bread. Who knows? I don't know. 
but it, it is legitimate currency. So it does, it actually holds its value where printed paper does not. Wow, I am just uh, really, let me just end here with Psalms 43. And this is the Bible that I am now underlining for my daughter. So every time I read to you, I underline it. One day, my daughter is gonna go, wow, my mom was so great. She's gone now, but she was so special and she used to read her Bible. And uh, it's funny how we don't appreciate the incredible legacy and the goodness of what we have and who we have in our lives sometimes until they're gone. I did appreciate my mom and dad in the final years. I spent a lot of time with them. <laughs> but in my 30s and 40s, I don't know. And my teenage year, years, oh wow, just a complete write off. But I turned out okay, mom and dad. Vindicate me, my God, Psalms 43 says, and plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from those who are deceitful and wicked. Do you know that God will rescue us? We need to ask him. God is such a gentleman that he never imposes himself into our lives. God never begged anyone to follow him. Jesus never had a conversation where, where he said, please, please, please follow me. He said, follow me. And he was sad when they didn't, like the rich young ruler who, who did not choose God. And ironically, that was the one who had all the money. And he didn't choose God. He didn't choose the ways of integrity, character, and having a relationship with the Lord. Rescue me from those who are deceitful and wicked. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Have you ever felt like that? David, I think, was having a bad day when he's like, you know, I don't feel like you're here. But that's not the end. Hang on. Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain to the place where you dwell. So even though David was obviously pretty depressed and he's going like, where are you, God? Have you rejected me? You're not here. I need you to show up right now and bring vindication and justice into this situation. I need you to save my life and people are trying to kill me. And you know, in David's day, they were trying to kill him with real swords, right? With real, real arrows were coming his way, like the kind that if they hit you, they're taking you out not just verbal assaults. They weren't just trying to hurt his feelings. They were trying to kill him. And he might have felt a little bit alone, but send me your light and your faithful care. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my joy, my delight. Oh, he's picking up, starting to feel a little better. He's talking about joy, talking about delight. <laughs> How do we get there? How do we get to joy? I don't know. This was a pretty sad one today. If this is what's going on in our nation, help me to get to joy and to delight. I will praise you, O oh God, my God. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? We need to ask ourselves that. In the heat of everything that we're facing, don't let yourself get down. If you're having a bad day and you just are letting all of this overwhelm you, ask yourself, why are you so down? Why are you so disturbed? Why are you letting the crisis rule your emotions? Why are you losing your hope and your faith? Why can we ask ourselves that? Because it says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him my Savior, and my God. A great place to put your hope. Thanks for watching. Take care. You know, it's not easy to deliver the truth of what our sick world is doing, but for some of us, we feel that we have no choice because if we are silent about these abominable things, then we are letting evil go unchecked and we cannot do that. For those of you wonderful people who are writing me and are sharing your encouragement, I am deeply grateful. Thank you for all the letters that you've been sending. Thank you for the donations and the support. I found out that in order to speak the truth, you have to become very, very strong. If you would go to my website at www.lauralyn.tv, you'll find all of the ways that you can contact me. Remember, my friends, all is well. All is well. Thanks for joining me.